Good morning, well, everybody. Well, welcome, you guys. Thanks so much for coming. Hi. That's awesome. My name is Noah. And I'm Sophie. Yeah. And Noah grew up here right in Essex. And we both farm just down the road. Maybe you recognize this big red barn. It's on 133. Um, so we get to farm right here in town. So do all of you know, what, what are some of the things that happen on farms? Does anybody? What's the point of a farm? You want to go? Um, you grow food? Mm-hmm. That pretty much says it. What yeah, are sums some it of up. The things? What are some yeah. of the foods that you know? Um, you get eggs and milk. Mm-hmm. We so don't have eggs and milk farm. on our farm, but a lot of farms grow eggs and milk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have some cows. We have some photos of them later. Yes? Um, you might grow like sometimes carrots, some like uh, carrots, broccoli, mm -hmm. cauliflower, mm -hmm. and tomatoes. Yeah, exactly. We grow mostly vegetables is what we spend our time doing. Um, and it's cool to think about farming in Essex, since this is a day celebrating Essex. Um, probably most of you live on land that either is a farm still or was a farm in the past. You have a question There's or comment? A barn in my yard. Yeah, so yeah. that probably housed equipment or animals. Does it still have animals in it? Um, kind of like the shipbuilding industry. There used to be a lot of it, and there's still some. And but one thing that we wanted you all to think about is, do any of you have stone walls in your yards? Maybe or you, nearby you? your house, have you noticed stone walls? So a long time ago, yeah. all of this land, there weren't very many trees, and these were all farms. And people found all of those rocks and stacked them up on top of each other to make all of those walls to hold the animals in. Hundreds of years ago. ago. So that's kind of a And so usually if you about. see one of those, that means it was a boundary to hold in animals. So it's usually sheep or sometimes cows. You have a question or a comment? Um, where the um, wall was, mm -hmm. um, used to be an apple orchard. Mm. That's why my street is called Apple Street. Oh, That's cool. Apple street. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We have, have, have some apples, too. Let's see what's the next picture. Yeah, let's see what else we got here. So this is a photo that is shows really how we are really situated in Essex. So this is actually one of our growing fields. This is after the winter, so it's kind of squashed down by snow after it's melted. But you can see that we're right on the marsh. And you know a lot of our friends farm inland, and you can do that. But we love farming next to the marsh because we can go swimming at high tide when it's really hot out and we're picking tomatoes. It's a great break during the day. Do you guys like swimming in the marsh? Yeah. yeah. I grew up on lakes. It took me a while to get used to the salt water, but the I love it. kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the time of year we're starting to plant a lot of seeds. It's spring, you know, it's too cold for a lot of the plants to be outside yet, but we're firing up our greenhouse. Um, do you guys ever plant seeds in your garden or at home? Yeah. I'm just like doing um, little, little, little plant Did, things. Yeah, Did seedlings. Did you see the greenhouse in the first picture? Yeah. That I saw? So it's this big, basically a big tent with clear plastic on it and the sunshine comes in and the heat can't leave and it gets really nice and warm in there. Yeah. So even in the middle of the winter, it's the nicest place to be because it's like you're in the tropics. I was working in there yesterday and I was just in a t-shirt. It got so hot and then I ran outside to get something. I was like, oh, so cool. <laughs> I gotta remember to put my jacket back on. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. I wanted to come. We have a greenhouse um, in the courtyard. Oh, here at school? Oh, awesome. Yeah, so Did fun. Do you have a question too? <clears throat> Um, so this is a, about a week later after I planted those seeds. There's a little tiny plant. Anyone want to guess what that is? It's kind of hard to tell. Take a guess. Green bean? No. Could be, but it's not this time. Did you have a guess? Okay. What, what do you get? They almost all look like this when they're babies, so I'm, we're kind of uh, being kind of mean to you guys. <laughs> but they send up two leaves first, and usually you can tell by the shape of those leaves at least what family it's in. Um, and so if you, if you gave this like another day, you could probably tell it was in the cabbage family. This is, we grow a lot of cabbage. Um, in and you guys like sauerkraut? Have any of you had sauerkraut? Or coleslaw? Uh, I had coleslaw. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, sauerkraut is uh, made out of fermented cabbage and it's really good on sausage. It's really salty. We sell a lot of that for sauerkraut. We grow some fruit. Um, you mentioned apples. We grow some apples too just for ourselves. Um, this is a big awesome watermelon. Anyone know what these are? Yeah? Ferns? They look like ferns. They have very feathery guess. tops, but they're not ferns. Do you have a guess? Carrots. Yeah. Carrots. Anyone want to guess how many carrots we grow? Yeah? A million? Ooh. Not quite that many. No, we had, yeah, maybe, yeah, not. If you stretched out the row of carrots, and your guess is how long that row would be every year? Um, um, 1,000 to 5,000 carrots. It's more than that. We grow, we grow them in beds along the field, but if you took the rows and stretched them out, it's two miles. So I don't know how far, is that like past downtown from here? Yeah, that's like from our farm to the Cox Reservation and Farnham's. Yeah, it's a really long way. So, so when we're there with our friends picking them. Hand weed and <laughs> Sophie but, plants it all by pushing this old machine uh, that was made in the 1920s. And it cuts a little furrow, a little, scratches a little mark in the soil and drops seeds just at the right length in it and then covers them back over. And then we and water them. And then sometimes they come in too thick and we have to go in and thin them out and it's a, it's a long process. But we always joke that when we do that with our friends, like you're friends for life after you do those two miles you together. spend a, long, a lot of time. Uh, this is a couple years old, this photo, but does anyone know who this is? Do you guys recognize? Yeah. Eli Amigo? Yeah, it yeah. is. He comes and his, hangs out with us sometimes. His mom helps us out a lot <laughs> and sometimes we get to spend time with Eli. And that's too. Isaac. I don't know if you guys know him. But. Um, and we get to grow a lot of weird vegetables. That's cool. Like when you go to the grocery store, you might have, you know, these perfect round, whatever fruits and vegetables. Um, but we get to pick out the seeds that we grow from catalogs from all over the world. So it's really fun to find old heirloom varieties or ones with weird colors. Do you know what an heirloom is? It's not um, usually yeah, yeah. a word that relates to vegetables all the time. You might hear it when you hear about antiques later. Um, but it means. Do you know what it means? Do you have an idea? Do you know? Um, like something really special and old. Yeah. Something old. that's passed down from one generation to another. Yeah, that's another. like worth keeping. Um, and you don't find them a lot on like big commercial farms because they might be a little wonky or hard to fit in a so. box or they might not be the most pretty. But like this is an heirloom tomato and it's just It means that so someone tasty. hundreds of years ago was growing this kind of tomato and it's this really special variety and they thought that it was so special that they would keep passing on the seeds year to year. They would save the seeds from the tomato and then plant it again. And give it to their grandchildren. And so we still have these tomatoes. And what's cool about, unlike a, say a piece of jewelry that's a family heirloom, an heirloom variety of tomatoes can multiply because there might be a couple hundred seeds. So. I could share with each of you, and then each of you could have some of my heirloom tomato and share it with your friends the next summer. So that's something that we think is really special. Yeah, seeds are really cool that way. Ooh, anyone know what these are? Can I take a guess? Strawberries? That's not a bad guess. Do have white they do flowers. have little uh, leaves like that, but not quite. Yeah? Nope, they're in the same family, so their leaves look kind of similar, but tomatoes get a lot taller. Do you have a guess? Green beans? Nope, they, the green beans grow in a bush like that. That's a good guess. Yeah? Basil? Another good guess, but they're a little too bushy, and basil doesn't it's really tough. have flowers like this. One. Yeah? Those like little tomatoes that grow in like the buds? Um, no, but very it's, it closely is in related the same to that, but it you the part you eat you might not be thinking of. Did you have a guess? Um, is it the, that tomato we just saw? No. Nope. No. Nope. It I'm probably leading you astray by saying they're related because they are related, but you might not know that. Um, think about what part of the plant you might be eating and and think really creatively. Um, is it squash? Nope. nope. 
um, squash kind of go crazy with their vines Think and about what we learned about the three sisters garden and we did a diagram of the three sisters garden we learned how corn squash and beans grow so you're guessing some of those things did those things look like this no, no. 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 so you have to be thinking differently yeah corn nope corn's really tall no, so we're not Ha. Avocados would be so cool if we could grow avocados in Essex. Be awesome. <laughs> avocados in Essex. Most of those are grown in um, more southern climates. Do you have a guess? Um, no. Oh, you're kind of getting in the right direction yeah. with where the food might be coming from, but that, that's not that's well, not it. We could give How you about a this? hint. Yeah. Okay. Potato. Yes. Yeah. So that's what potato plants look like. That isn't that crazy. All the french fries, potato chips, baked potatoes, mashed potatoes, potatoes in soup. Yeah, exactly. They're actually, the potatoes grow these really fine little roots, and then these are called tubers, technically, that kind of pop out those little fine roots. And it's cool um, when you're taking, you know, the potato plant can be huge and happy, but it needs to be really happy for it to decide to put on potatoes. So it's a fun crop to take care of because the more you nurture it, the more huge things you get to find as a surprise at the it's end of the year. It's one of my favorite things to pick because like, you can't really tell what's there until you start digging and it's kind of like finding buried treasure. Yeah, or, it's like definitely digging for treasure. You get really dirty though. And anyone know what this one is? Yeah? Onion? Close. Close. Garlic. Nope. Garlic. Garlic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you guys like garlic? I've never, I've never I like garlic, garlic bread. bread. Garlic bread is delicious. Yeah, I, I, don't I, like, I don't like this. How about kind? garlic bread? <laughs> garlic is my favorite vegetable. Yeah, I love putting it in soup. <coughs> but a little bit goes a long way for sure. Wait, it's like garlic bread. Yeah, mm. that's what we're talking about. <laughs> okay. Oops. I thought did I. Miss, does anyone know what this is? I missed one photo. I don't know. How, can you go back? No. Anyone know what these are? We grow a lot, um, some of this. You know, I guess. They are seeds. Um, I missed. Should I try to go back a photo? Yeah. Yeah, if you, see. yeah. Um, maybe just. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Yeah, we so this is uh, what the crop looks like. You have a guess? Yeah, wheat, exactly. Um, and it's really cool. We grow a lot of this in Essex. Uh, we'll grow in one field. We'll have wheat one year, and then the next year we'll have vegetables. So we can... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's a really nice way to rest the soil because vegetables can be really hard on the land. Um, and this is a, a really nice way to just cover it and let it go for a year and grow this huge grain crop. So that's what they look like um, after they come out of the combine. What, there's a Got photo this. of that later. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can make bread. <laughs> it's so cool to be able to grow so, the garlic for the garlic bread and have it with your soup that's made with the potatoes. Yeah, you have a question? Um, there? Hmm? Because I thought the beans were coffee beans. Those seeds in my yeah. hand? Oh, yeah. Those yeah, are also a seed. I like that. It's, yeah. it's kind of tricky because it's a black and white picture. Yeah. So it, the color doesn't quite show up the way Yeah, it they're kind of light brown. Do you have a question or comment? Um, how big is your farm? That's a good question. We have a lot of land that is too wet to grow vegetables on. It's kind of <coughs> like pretty low lying. So we grow um, grass for the cows there. And then our actual vegetable fields are, um, we grow about three acres, which I don't know if in like soccer fields. Hmm. Is that like six or seven, eight soccer fields? I don't know. Okay. How's, how's your soccer field to acreage conversion? <laughs> <any of you? laughs> um, but it, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things, but um, it, it definitely keeps us busy. We have 90, so a lot of our, our food, uh, different families come every week, all winter long, and we've got food and storage and people come and pick up a box and it's called a CSA which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Yeah, do and any so of you or your friends have CSAs on the farm? Sometimes people call we, it a share. Yeah. yeah. You hear your parents say that like we're going to pick up our food share or mm -hmm. crop share. And we have 90 families that come every week even though we just do three acres of vegetables. Uh, they come all winter long and 
it's really fun because we get to see all our friends every week. They come to the farm and pick up their vegetables. Yeah. So, but doesn't wheat grow in the winter? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we plant it in September. It's kind of a weird time to be planting Which, yeah, seeds. it seems a little strange because it's getting colder every day. And it grows about this tall, and then it goes to sleep all winter long. It just sits there. So it doesn't really grow all winter, it but it can be it under the snow, and it's still bright green. It's like a pretty amazing really crop. What's really important is that it covers the soil so that the soil doesn't wash away when the snow melts and it rains a lot. Um, and so it helps protect the land, which is very important to us. And then in the spring, it wakes up again. Like right now. And produces wheat, and we harvest the wheat in July. So that picture there, it's almost ready to harvest. So that would have been the end of June or beginning of July. Yeah, another question. Uh, what, what is your farm? What's your farm's name? Oh, Alprilla Farm. That's like another really good right. question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we just threw in some photos of all the cool equipment and tools that we get to use. This is our truck. Uh, it's an old truck from the 80s. It's Noah uh, put an awesome hood decal on, and we call this truck the Golden Eagle. He's actually working on it right now. It's, it's been in the shop. It's in many pieces right now. <laughs> Hopefully we'll put it back but together someday. It's awesome for trucking vegetables around the farm. Um, oh, this is, uh, do you want to talk about the combine, Noah? Sure. This is one of our tractors that this we get to This is one use. of my favorite toys. It's kind of like a dinosaur. <laughs> it was built in the 1950s, so probably when your grandparents were kids. And it drives, it, the tractor pulls it along, and it drives along, and there's a basically a row of scissors here, and that chops off the grain. Remember the grain was on, the wheat was on those tall stalks? And these paddles whack it onto a conveyor belt where there's a spinning fan that cracks, it hits it so hard that the grain flies off of the stalks. And then there's a giant shaking screen <laughs> with a fan under it. And this, when, you, when this thing is going, the whole machine's just kind of jumping up and down and making all kinds of clattering and clanking. I always feel and like it's just going to fall apart. Eventually, all of the straw, so that's what straw is, is the stalks from grain, gets spat out the back, and all of the clean grain ends up in this tank here. And that's how. That's what Noah was harvested. holding when um, you said it looked like coffee beans was out of that tank. Mm -hmm. So that's a really fun it's tool. It's a fun tool. <laughs> It's really cool once you have a crop that you want to grow, you have to figure out like all the tools you need to assemble to grow it. And depending on how much of it you're growing, you can use different kinds of tools. Uh, this is another fun one that we can use with our friends. We're actually planting like oops, little tiny baby onions. Um, and this is a transplanter. And it, you just ride along here. Usually this is a little bit lower down when we're on the bed and you're just planting as fast as you can. I always feel like I'm playing a video game or something and you're sitting next to your friend and trying to uh, you know, beat each other or help each other out if someone misses planting one. And then the person driving the tractor is like, faster, faster. You can't see it on the, end of, on the bucket of the tractor, but there's a big tank of water and a hose that runs back. And each of these little spikes here drops a little bit of water in the hole so that when you stick the baby plant in, it has plenty of water to drink when it's just getting started. Yeah. This, is, this field is um, on Island Road. I don't know if any of you guys have gone hiking up into the Stavros Reservation, yeah, but any of you, you would walk right the by that kiosk on Island Road. It's a pretty cool place. You can you keep an eye on our crops growing there yeah. if you go by. Um, do you guys must ride bicycles? Around? Yeah, I will want to ride bicycles. Sometimes. Yeah. We, uh, we just dug our bikes out of the barn to get them tuned up for the year because our fields are spread out a little bit along Route 133, and so we're up and down the road bicycles all the time. So they're really useful on the farm. Um, oh, we haven't talked about these guys yet. So we have a pair of oxen, um, and they, 
these were the animals that everyone used to build all those stone walls we were talking about at the beginning. Um, I grew up raising oxen, and so when I met Noah, we decided to get a pair to have on the farm. And uh, it was really fun. We got them when they were little tiny babies. They were only a few days old, and so we trained them. And now, a few years later, they're huge. <laughs> And now they're so big and strong, they can really do a lot of work. And it's so fun hanging out with them. I mean, we love driving tractors, too. Their names are Cedar and Clay. This yeah. is Cedar, and that one's Clay. <laughs> I can't even tell the difference. I know, they look really similar. Cedar's a little fatter. <laughs> Clay has, has big horns. Um, but now that they're so big and strong, we can use them in the vegetable fields. Um, and so this, usually I'm driving, and Noah rides on this, um, and it goes over the bed, and he, we can put on all kinds of different tools to do different things to the ground or the crops that are there. And just the four of us hanging out for the morning, it's really fun. Sometimes it's good to use tractors because you can get a lot done really, really fast. And other times it's really, really fun to use the oxen because it's a lot quieter, and uh, the oxen are kind of my friends. Yeah. So it's nice to spend They're time total with them. goofballs. <laughs> they they look really big and a little bit scary, but they're a lot like a cat or a dog where they really just want you to scratch behind their ears or behind their horns because they can't reach behind their horns and it gets itchy back there sometimes. <laughs> so that's probably what Cedar wants me to be doing in this yeah. picture. Sometimes not really. They, I mean, but not like up here though. If they, yeah. when they're out in the pasture in the summer, they'll find a tree and just like scratch their face all over. It's really funny. So in the winter, then we try to do that for them. Uh, we have some chickens for eggs. I don't know if you guys are going to Chris Grant. Uh, he's another farmer in town, a friend of ours, and he brought a chicken today. And we're like, oh, yeah, well, we're not as cool as that. <laughs> if only we could have brought our oxen. <laughs> Uh, but we do have other cows that we uh, have out on pasture all summer. They're definitely loving the big open space, running around like goofballs here. And yeah, we raise a lot of them. And we get to eat all the food that we grow. It's really fun. We have a lot of friends stopping through to help us grow stuff. You have a question? What do you do with the cows? We eat their meat. There for beef. We don't. We we take them to a slaughterhouse up in New Hampshire, okay. and they do it. It's kind of sad, and it's something that we're not totally comfortable with. But it's something that people eat, and it means that we get to keep cows on our farm, which we like. And give them a good yeah, good time while they're here. They had a really good life. They do have a good life. That's for sure. Do you have another question? Yes. So, um, on the farm, do you, do you like, kill the parents so that the baby ones can grow up and then so expensive? We actually buy yearling animals, so animals that are a year old. Anyone want to guess how big a cow is when it's a year old? How many pounds? You want to take a guess? guess? Um, 20? No, a lot bigger. Yeah. At least. I think they're almost 50 right. pounds when they're born. <laughs> if to give a guess. Did you have a guess? How about you? Um, 95? Getting there. Even more. 250 pounds. More. <laughs> Do you have a guess? Close. They're Good. 500 pounds when they're a year old. And you know, they're just an animal it's about this but big, but they're... <laughs> <laughs> so, so we get them when they're about 500 pounds, and then we keep them for another year and a half, and they get up to around 13 or 1,400 pounds. Um, so we don't, the cows aren't born on the farm anymore. We buy them from a guy up in Maine who has a bunch of mama cows and then we buy the babies. You have another question? Um, my friend, um, he has a farm up in Maine. I don't think he does um, animals, but he does lots of 
um, fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes visit him a lot. And for some reason, I feel like the trip's going to be for like five hours or something. But it's yeah, like Maine's far away. It's really short. It's so fun to visit farms. Yeah. yeah. What's all your favorite vegetables? Yeah? Apples. Apples. So good. You can grow those in Essex pretty easily, very readily. Yeah? Apples. Mm-hmm. So good. How about you? Uh, can I do a fruit? Yeah. Everyone else seems to. Hmm? A lemon. A lemon? Mm. Can't really grow those in Essex unless you have a, a greenhouse, but they're so good. I love that. Ooh, nice combo. Yeah. Um, I like corn and watermelon. Mm. You could both grow those in your garden. They're so good. How about you back here? I like apples and bananas. Mm. So good. Yeah? Mango. Mango? Wow. I wish we could grow those here. Orange. Mm. Mm. Those are very special, especially this time of year. How about you? Carrots, apples, Mm. Man, I can't wait for summer when all these fresh veggies are going to come in. Good morning. It's time to move on to your next session. Thank you. Do you guys have any last questions before it's time to go to the next session? Um, I just forgot. Okay. Do you have a question? Um, what do you usually produce the most? We grow a lot of potatoes and carrots and garlic. I think those are. And winter squash. But in volume, yeah. we produce the most hay to feed the cows. To fill a whole barn with hay, but then the cows eat it all. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. I've mentioned it before and I'll say it again. I absolutely love clamming. I feel like it was what I was born to do. Um, the first time I ever went clamming was with a very good friend of mine who, who's been dead for probably 40 years. His name was Chris Ginn. He, he, um, Cedar Creek Farm, the one on the way to Ipswich. Uh, he invited me to go clamming with him in his boat. And uh, we went down towards Hog Island, right on the bridge. And uh, as soon as I had the clam fork in my hand, I knew I was home. I, uh, I, that day I dug over a bushel of clams and we took them upriver and sold them to Chubby Woodman and I made a good amount of folding money too, which made me happy also. So I knew that I was called to do something and that was clamming and I've been doing it on and off for the next 50 years. I knew I loved nature and I loved the salt water and so I started going regularly and I, uh, I got my commercial license not fa far after that from Ernie Lord who was an old, uh, old timer in Essex right on Pond Street and I used to buy my commercial licenses there. Digging in Gloucester is different than digging in Essex. Uh, first of all I have two families of clamors. I know all the Essex clam diggers and have most of my life. And now that I moved to Gloucester 10 years ago, now I have a whole bunch of new friends and I dig with those guys over there. We're, we're very close. Sometimes we'll be digging on a flat the size of this room. There'll be 15 of us in tight. And it's kind of funny because uh, you know, we kind of run over each other and we get in each other's way. We're polite, but it can get territorial too. When, you know, you're digging right towards a guy and you cut him off, you get the look. And uh, that means back off. Because clamors are, uh, we're very independent because we work for ourselves. And we're also very strong because we, what we do is we move large portions of sand and mud every single day. I'll show you how we do it. These are different types of clam forks. This is the old fork from the 60s and 70s. There's only a couple of guys that use these little four prongers anymore. This is the clam fork I use today. It's a four pronger, but you can see it's bent. 
and uh, we custom make our own clam forks. And that's a five pronger there, and this is a six pronger there. This is a war club here. That's a big boy. So what we do is, uh, now a clammer leaves about three hours before a low tide. Here's my tide calendar. I live by the tides because I have to know when to be downriver to, so I can get the clams. The clams get exposed about three hours before low tide and then they're covered over at about three hours after low tide. And so we have about a six hour window to get them. I know that. I know where I'm going to go almost every day. I have a game plan and I know, I even know how many clams I want to get. And uh, so I head out and I go to the clam flat I picked out. I park my boat or I walk out and I find an area. Let's just say these two rugs right here are a clam flat. And I'll look and, and clams expose themselves. They're underneath the sand or the mud, but you can see a hole on top of them. And we have an expression in clamming, no one else would ever know it. Are they showing, we say to each other. And that means, are the clams showing themselves today? Some days they don't show at all. You're blind digging. But when they're showing, you can get more clams and it's a lot easier. So I'll see if they're showing and if they are, I'm happy. Because that means I'm going to have a good day. And say that I see a nice patch where they're close together. Not this far apart, but you know, say there's like 10 clams between these two tines. I know that I'm going to have uh, a fair amount of clams. So I bend over, I start my hole. This is the hardest part of clamming, starting the hole, depending on how hard the sand is or the mud. And I'll bend over and I'll start taking out chunks, probably about this wide. I don't want to be too wide because, the, um, you know, it'll kind of fill itself in. Now clams, uh, the small ones are on the top because of gravity, the big ones are on the bottom. Clams get to be about this big, these soft shell clams, and the little ones are about this big. A clam has to be two inches in order for you to take it legally. And that ring is right there, so I can slip the uh, clam through there. And if the shell of the clam hits, that means it's, it's a legal clam. But if it can fit through there, i got to put it back or leave it there. So I'm moving in one direction towards where the holes are. And I'm digging, I'm digging, and I grab a few clams, and I throw them in my bucket, and I keep going, making my hole nice and neat so I can see where all the clams are and getting right down to the deepest part because the biggest clams weigh the most and we sell by weight. I dig about 150 clams, 150 pounds a day, upwards to 200 pounds and we do have a limit in Gloucester, it's 200, I think Essex is 250 and I think Ipswich is 300. And, uh, we can make a fair amount of money depending upon what the price is, but it is hard work. So I go ahead and I dig that hole out until there's no more clams. And I take my bucket, if it's filled, and I'll take my bag here that I keep my clams in. And I'll dump it out, fill it up. Usually you fill it about like this. I fill it in 25 pound bags because I'm an old man now. Some of the youngins, they, they put 50 pounds in a bag and haul them around. And then I'll put them in the water to keep them fresh. So that, uh, you know, if they lay out in the sun, um, it will, uh, you know, shorten their shelf life. And if I lay them out in the winter time, they'll freeze. And you don't want them to freeze. So you put them in the water and they'll stay fresh. So you have to be careful with them. They are perishable. Then I, uh, I take all those clams and I put them in my truck or my car and I take them to market. We're, we're shellfish harvesters is what we're called. We're clam diggers, but we're also harvesters. So we can't sell our clams to restaurants or we sell to wholesalers who shuck them out for frying clams 
or sell them in the shell for clam bakes or for steamers. And uh, it's, it, it's an interesting business. Now the shuck clams are the frying clams and you folks, you kids know Woodman's, the village. Farnham's. Yeah, I like Farnham's too. That's where me and my mom eat mostly. And uh, it's been one of the uh, greatest parts of uh, the town of Essex, the clamming, because all the tourists come in to go to our restaurants and our antique stores. So basically, this town is run quite a bit by the clams and by the fish in Gloucester, too. And uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and I just love it. Uh, I love being outside. Um, I always have. I started um, fishing when I was quite young, too, in Shabaco Lake uh, when I was about 10 years old. And uh, I still love fishing today, and I'm 66. And uh, I still commercially fish occasionally. I, I, I fish for striped bass, and uh, they're all through uh, Cape Ann, uh, Rockport, Manchester, Essex have a lot of striped bass and you can see them in the water when I'm going down clamming and if I see a couple of big fish I'm going to get them later. <laughs> I'm going to make a note and see where they are because fish have a tendency to come back to the place where they uh, they feed. So this is um, this is a map uh, made by Franklin Goucher who was a uh, Clam warden and famous uh, clammer in Essex. He had a shucking house in South Essex. He and his wife worked it, and he actually wrote a book called Clam Digger Stories, and it's actually pretty funny. You can get it at the Essex Library. And he was a character. Um, when we had, uh, we had a red tide hitting the, uh, I don't know if you folks know what a red tide is. It's, it's basically paralytic seafood poisoning. There's these blooms, like mushroom blooms, out in the Gulf of Maine. And when, in the spring, when they bloom and they let out these spores, the northeast wind will blow it into the shore and it'll affect the seafood. It'll affect the clams, particularly in the mussels and the sea clams, and uh, it can make people sick. And so when Franklin Goucher was warden back then, we did a project. We would dig the small clams from the Salem willows and we'd bring them, we brought them back to Essex and we would plant them because we couldn't dig clams. They were polluted. So um, he put this project together and it kept us busy for quite a while. I think the flats were closed almost two years then though. So I had to go on to, uh, to find something else to do. I ran a store for my dad. And that hurt because I love what I do. And that was a long time off of clamming. And I actually changed careers and um, ran my dad's store for several years. And then I moved out to California for 15 years. Um, I did fish out there. But I came back in 2000, and I've been clamming ever since. I've been clamming for 20 years, 10 in Essex, and 10 in Gloucester. And uh, it's such a wonderful way to live. It's so healthy. Um, there's a, some maps right here that I have. Oh yeah, these are, uh, these are booties that we dig with during the summer because these boots are hot and they're kind of clumsy and uh, so we opt for these babies here and these are a lot easier to walk around mostly you you wear them so you won't cut your feet on the shells or on anything else these are maps of the, the uh, clam flats in Essex and in Gloucester it's really funny there there's a uh, 56 in Gloucester named uh, Clam Flats, and there's 57 in Essex, and they've got some crazy names, like one in Gloucester is called Two Penny Loaf, and that's when bread was only two cents a loaf, 
and I don't know how or why they named it, but it was named probably during the 1800s. And then right next to it is Mabel Lane's, obviously. There was a gal named Mabel Lane who owned a property really close to this place, and so that's how it was named. And uh, they're so interesting. Uh, the bridge, that's where we actually uh, planted those seeds with Franklin Goucher and the program. Uh, the bridge used to go over to Hog Island when, uh, and you can still see the pilings there. So there's a real lot of history involved in clamming and uh, it's so interesting. I find stuff down river all the time. I'll find really old bottles. I have a good collection of them. We'll always be digging up boots. Someone found someone's watch years ago and it was a Timex. It was still working. You know, it, it is amazing. And uh, actually one of the clamors in Ipswich found a chunk of gold down there and no one knows how much it was, but all of a sudden he had a new truck. So I think it was a pretty good find. It's the reason I love clamming is because of the nature, but also it's kind of like treasure hunting. You never know what you're going to find, but you know you're going to find clams. And if you find a whole bunch, you're going to make a good day's pay. And uh, being independent is wonderful. If my wife tells me we have to do something and then I can't go clamming that day. Because <laughs> she's the boss and I'm not. So anyways, these are the, uh, you can pass these around, but try not to get too distracted. Uh, what time are we going till? 9.45. 9.45. Okay, I'll blab on for a couple of more minutes, and then we'll do some questions and answers. I've been really lucky um, to be born in Essex because I feel like what a wonderful place to live. What a great childhood. Um, having Shabaco Lake, Lake right in my backyard and one of our neighbors, uh, a Burnham, took me down river um, when I was eight years old and I fell in love with the Essex River. I can remember though there was a crab walking around and I reached down and grabbed it and it bit me and it hurt. So, I learned that lesson. It's like a hot stove. You don't grab a crab by the claws. You grab it by the back, just like you do a lobster. But Essex is such a wonderful little town. And uh, I did go to Gloucester High School because um, when I was uh, that age, they sent uh, the high school students over to Gloucester instead of Manchester, Essex now, right? Love Conomo Point, go down there quite a bit. I was there this morning just checking on, see who was clamming, because I took the day off. Actually, I'm going to go this afternoon. There was a little tide this morning, and there's a little tide tonight. We call those cross tides or double tides. One of the regulations in clamming is, is that you can't dig clams at night. You can't use a light, and you have to start digging clams a half hour before sunrise till a half hour after sunset. And there's several reasons for that. First of all, it's protect the clams themselves to make sure that there's going to be enough. And that's why we have a limit, too, of 200 or 250 pounds, whatever it is, because if you were allowed to dig both tides a day for the whole year, they'd be gone in a matter of a few years. And the clams don't always seed that well either, which is very interesting also. It seems like back decades ago, they used to seed almost every year. Now they seed like every five or 10 years, and we don't know if it's environmental or whatever reason. So we have to be careful that we don't over dig the species because if we do, then we're all out of work. So um, there is that, and we, most of the clamors are passionate about what they do. They love what they do because it's enjoyable, it keeps us strong, we sleep hard and we eat hard and we play hard. And uh, 
Yeah, man, I love clamming. So questions? Yes, sir. So um, whenever you're clamming, do you ever, like, does the fork ever, like, break a shell to clam? Oh, yes. That's a great question. A lot of times they do, especially when they're thick, when there's a whole bunch of them. And we don't take those because what happens is, is that if you have a broken clam and it dies in the bushel, it'll kind of, uh, it's not great for the other healthy clams to be around. All right. Have you ever climbed on any of the flats on the Yukon River? A lot of them. Yes, I have. Once huh? I actually, um, me and my friends, I had like four friends that live in Anaquam. We went down, we actually got like 40 clams and we brought them home and we skinned them. Good job. Um, what's the, like, have you ever had, like, what's the largest clam that you've ever, like, dug up? Well, that's a great question, too. When I lived in Washington State on the Puget Sound, there's a very famous clam called the gooey duck. And the shell is like this big, but the neck is like this long on it. They actually hard hat dive for them in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. But in a really big minus tide, we've got some big minus tide. There's a big one today because there's a full moon, but it has to be a run out of about four feet and you can dig three of these clams out in Washington state, it was huge. And locally, we dig sea clams, which are on the bars in front of Crane Beach. And there's a, an inside of Crane Beach, too, and outside. They're, they get to be about this big. They get to be a pound. And I bake stuff them. Have you ever found, like, money or, like, a phone in the flats? I, I haven't found a phone, but I've lost four or five of them. Done. <laughs> I dropped my wife's in the boat last year. She was mad because it ate her contacts up. But, and I found not too much money, but like I said, I found really nice bottles. And I've metal detected before too and found some coins, but not with digging per se. I'm looking for a treasure though, hopefully a hidden pirate's treasure. Two years ago, when I was on the Antoine River, my boat sank and I was in the water for like 20 minutes. And after that, I was like shaking really hard because I got like a little bit of hypothermia. Glad you made it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How often do you find treasure? Treasure? Um, or bottles and, and uh, you mean when I'm metal detecting or when I'm clamming? Uh, both. I haven't been metal detecting. I gave away my detector, but in certain areas that are close to houses, you can find them in where I keep my boat on Water Street. I have a mooring there. There's some great stuff there. I found a bottle that was worth, I don't know, 50 bucks. I didn't sell it, I gave it away. But depending if they're close to houses, you're more likely to find some, some cool stuff. And back? Um, do you ever dig up clams and then decide that you're gonna keep some for yourself for like dinner or something? All the time, and I give a lot away too. And uh, it's really fun because the reason I like to give them away, and I only give them away when they're day fresh, because oftentimes when you go to uh, a fish store or fish market, they're going to be two, three, four days old, and they're still very fresh, but there's nothing like day fresh clams. They are some delicious. Um, uh, me and my friend Chase actually live on Captain Red. Yeah, I lived it. You know that real big house on the top? Yeah. That used to be mine when I was a kid. Did you know Rick? Rick means? Uh, Rizzo, the owner of Fence Company. That's my brother. That's my kid brother. Yes, I love him. He's my best friend. Yes. I actually have a question. So when you're out planning, like mm -hmm. how many other people are doing it at the same time as you? That's a really good question. And I like to dig by myself because of the solitude. I love the quiet. And so I'm not really a kind of guy that will migrate to a bunch of other clamors. Even though it's better digging, I would rather dig less clams and be quiet. But yes, like right now, they're all balled up on the Anasquam River. There's like 20 guys digging right next to each other. And I find it somewhat chaotic and somewhat noisy. I wear headphones when I'm down there too. And not so I don't have to hear the other clamors, so I don't have to hear myself.
<laughs> yes, one more question. Oh. Those are sea clams, and and they they have different names from surf clams, sea clams, or mahoganies, or bar clams. They call them several different things, but they are delicious. Bring them home to your mom and have her bake stuff them. She can go online, and you know, or you can call me up and I'll show you how to do it. Are the are the uh, no? We got another question. Yes. Well, um, it certainly helps if you have a boat, but uh, you can walk, but it's not necessarily so. I really don't like motors. I have a tendency to break stuff. So I row down river now, and I like it. It's quiet, once again, and I row down in a hunting boat. It's called a John boat, but I'm, I'm going to get my uh, clamming boat. It hasn't been working too good the last several months, so... I'm going to get it fixed in the spring here, and I'll probably be going out again in the boat. Please make your way to your next presentation. Thank you. Thanks for listening. So I want to tell you a bit about Essex Shipbuilding, and then we're going to do some more hands-on activities. Does that sound good? All right. Sounds good. So does anybody have an idea how long we've been building ships for in Essex? More than 100. 200. More than 200. More than a little bit more than 300. 310. A little bit more than that. 315. More. 350. Exactly. 350 years, and over that super long time, how many boats do you think we've been able to build? Like, like a million. Not a million. More one than million. a thousand. Seven thousand one million. Like a little more than half of that. Um, no. Not a number. Like half of that. What's half of eight? Four. Four thousand. Can you picture four thousand ships? No. 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 Me neither. That's I a can, lot. I can, I, can. Picture, I can picture. I can picture four thousand pieces of tiny little pieces of wood. Me too. So so off. if you can make enough. those grow. All right, so this is a cool picture, but I want to show you another one. Do you know what Essex was called before it was Essex? Uh, Anybody Beverly. can say it. Not Beverly. It's switch. Exactly. So we were called the Tobacco Parish of Ipswich, absolutely, but the tobacco word is the one I'm looking for. It's a very important word around Essex, isn't it? We see it on Tobacco Market and all over the place. Tobacco Lake. Tobacco Lake. We've even named a type of boat after tobacco. So this is a tobacco boat. And these, how old do you think the people in that boat are? Like 100 years old. No, how old were they when this drawing like was made? A no. Like, no, like 90, 30. No, like, no, like 50. How old are you? Eight. I'm yeah, you'd be fit to do that. So you'd be going out fishing with your dad around the age you are now. Do you think you I, could do that? Yeah. I do that. Oh, I go yeah. Fishing. I go fishing with my dad. So you guys are already experts. Yeah. yeah. I go fishing with my grandfather when we visit in Florida. That's fantastic. So you guys already know. So this is one of the things that would have been going on in Essex, the reason why we're building these boats. What is that over there? I'm going to talk all about that. So, anybody know who this guy is? No. 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 Does anyone know where I work? I realized I didn't say where I work. It's the boogeyman. It's not the boogeyman. <laughs> where do I work? Um, I don't know, but I, is it like the owner? It's the owner of the shipyard. So I work at the Essex Shipbuilding Museum, and the museum sits on the 80-story shipyard. That is our museum. And so this is Arthur Story, 80-story. And these are the people that worked for him in the 1800s. Takes a lot of people to build these boats, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And a horse. And a horse. You need a horse. How many okay. boats are in this picture? A hundred. Three? three? No, one, two, three, four. Four. Exactly. Four and is our magic number. 
broken pieces or maybe pieces that have yet to be put on the boat? Yet to put on the boat. Right. So, do you see this boat all the way, if you can see the shadow of my finger, that boat all the way at the end? No. no yes. yes. That boat is called the Letty G. Howard and she is still sailing. She is the oldest Essex schooner to still be sailing. She sails out of New York and she takes anybody who would like to go sailing on her out. Is that pretty cool? Yeah? Kind of uh, cool? Uh, amazing? I think it's amazing. So, I want to talk to you a bit about the process of shipbuilding, and that's why I have my box that looks like a dragon with me today. Whoa. That is no, one. Like yep, it's just water. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like bad in it. It's like hot water. It's hot water, that's exactly and right. It's going to turn into heat. It's, yes, exactly. And so, it's we're going to talk. It's like boat fuel. It, sort of. We're going to talk all about that in a minute, but first, we've got to start from the beginning. This guy, yeah. what does it look like he's doing? Measuring yes. He's measuring. he's measuring. A lot of math involved in this step. Yep. He's measuring like how long the piece of meat should be. Exactly. Yep. Do you have any more? Um, he's measuring it if it's a good size to put on the boat to build. Right. All of everything you've said is correct. He is doing a step called lofting. He's measuring out each individual piece of I'm the boat. Lofting. Yeah, exactly. So this happens up in a loft, and that's why we call it that. So he's in the top floor of Harold Burnham's barn, drawing out all the lines for the Thomas E. Lannan. Wait, is he alive to Harold Burnham? Yes, he is. How old is he? He's like 50. He's not that old. <laughs> so we take those lines, and we cut all our pieces of wood, and we make what are called frames for the boat. Do you have frames in your body? What are they? Bones. Bones. Bones, exactly. And specifically your rib cage. Yes. Are they making the boat <coughs> that's like the big, big boat that's like in downtown? The Goulart that's up, on, up in a cradle in our yard? She's there because she's a super old boat that we're studying. So she's not being built right now. But good, that's wait, a good thought. Is, they do like lots of holes. This is a different boat. What? Wait. Like the oldest one has like big, is like has old wood. Yes, very old wood. Yeah. Um, and there's like a building near there that mm -hmm. has like, that's like an art place, I think. Mm hmm. There's many art places, yeah. Yeah, my mom goes there. Cool. Because she's in charge of the an art place. Cool. So these are the frames that go into our boat, and this is another view of them. This is from the inside looking at those frames. Yeah, that's, that's the bottom for holding the boat. Right, that's the inside part, and the bottom is right here. Yeah. It does look like a rib cage. So I have a harder question. What do these look like? What do they look like? They do, right? Yes. What do they look they like? Kind of look like oh, you've got it. Yeah, do you know you're the first new, person all day I, to get that? I knew that. I Good. Like, so the nails. So, but hold on. Are they metal or are they wood? No, they're wood. They are wood. So I don't call them nails, though. I call them trunnels. And on boats, we like to smush woods, words together. And so we started calling them tree nails. And now we call them trunnels. Does that sound a little easier than tree nails? Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm going to have you take a giant scooch back away from my hot box, OK? Yeah. Thank you. So these are tree nails, or trunnels, and they're what's going to hold the boat together. If I put a metal nail in a wooden boat and put it in salt water, what happens to the yeah. metal? No. I need hands. <gasps> what happens to the metal? Yes. It melt. There's it's another melt. word. Rust. Rust. It does look like it's melting though. And it will make the wood look like it's melting as well. And so we use wood instead. If you see the goulart who's in our yard and she looks like she's falling apart, she had metal pieces in her. She had metal nails holding her together. And there's no none left. The only thing that remains is the trunnels. Is that pretty cool? Yeah. So, we've got another box spouting steam. Exactly. Why would I steam a huge piece of wood? Yeah. Um, to like make 
make the wood like not like warm to not make it cold for the So we want it to be warm. Why do I care about it being warm? So we can use it for like go with the other pieces. Go with the other pieces better. I'm looking for the word about the shape it can make. <gasps> Yes. You can like bend easily. Exactly that word, bend. I want to be able to bend like the wood. Like so what I'm like what like I've brought today right is a steam box so that we can steam bend together. Bend right there. Yeah, exactly. So this is a whole nother view. The boat has been fully planked on the side, so those ribs are all com covered in wood now. And we're looking at the deck, the part where the people will walk on. Do you see any straight lines in this picture? You do? Can you point one out to me? Can you get up and look? Go ahead, get up and, and point to one. Oh, they look straight, don't they? But it's an optical illusion. Do you know what that word means? Yes. yes. Good. Exactly. So it's actually curved. Another weird word, it's called camber. So when, when you put it like on the on like the boat, mm -hmm. I guess it like hardens. Mm -hmm. It does, it cools and hardens. What I'm getting after here is that there's like n almost no straight lines on a boat. We're always needing to make wood do other things that it may not so want to do. It's like the eyes It's an optical illusion because we've had to manipulate the wood. So in this case, I don't want my deck flat. Have you ever seen a puddle? Yeah. What happens when a puddle sits on wood for a long time? Uh, it, make, it, moves. it moves. No, no, it, it's, it's an like R word. It, that absorbs from the No, nope, I'm looking for an R word. Emma? It makes the wood kind of like not really good. It makes exactly. it squishy. The word I'm looking for is rot, and that's exactly what happens. It gets squishy. So on boats, we want the water to just shed and move away from the wood. Yeah. Um, I know that because me and my dad built a ice skating rink. Right yeah. So yep. We had to bend pieces, mm -hmm. pieces that have yellow bones. Yep, exactly. So there's there's lots of reasons we need to bend wood. And yes, because there's a reason, another reason is that even if you don't bend it, and it's like really flat. You could easily, the weight will like push it down. Just like a bridge. But with the, the curve means it gets less weight. Exactly. And because the tip goes down, but the, the sides hold it up. Exactly. So this is a picture of a boat that's almost finished. They've launched it, and the only thing left is some of the finish work on the top. So I wanted to show you a really big boat that we've launched out of our yard. Uh -oh. The next picture is very special. Oh. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but Essex is a very special place for launching boats. And we do something called the Essex Side Launch. Anybody have an idea of why I would want to launch a boat on its side? Uh, like yes. No. It might sink. I'm, I'm looking more toward talking about our river. Is the Essex River very deep? Yeah. No. no. The no's have it. The Essex River is not very deep. And so what I don't want to happen is the boat to come down off the launch ramp and get stuck in the Essex mud. We wouldn't be able to go anywhere, would we, until the tide came back and floated her off. So what's happening is we're making the boat lean over and if the boat was a person, we'd be launching them on their hip. So the sh more shallow part of her is going in first and then she pops up like a cork. Is that pretty cool? Yeah, so because yeah. she's Hold on, she, and she raised her hand. Exactly. Yes. Um, I think I've seen that part. I'm sure you have. I hope you have. Cause yes. Because my dad goes so. Because my dad goes clearing and I, yeah. I think I've seen that. Mm -hmm. So, so it, because usually the sides are not uh, not that big. The the tip is like really long, but the sides aren't. Exactly. And 
exactly. And that it gets really shallow, really shallow. Exactly. Start, right. And really shallow. Mm -hmm. so yes. I actually never saw this place because I moved here like not a long time. That's okay. I don't. I don't even live here. I just come and work here. So I only get to visit on days what like do this. You live? I live in Woburn right now, pretty far away. I have a very long commute. So I wanted to show Whoa. you some of the coolest boats that have been built in Essex. Yeah, so cool. Some of our biggest and our most impressive. And some that are also still sailing and have been built recently. So this is the Gertrude Tebow. She's a super fast boat. And do you know who the Blue Nose is? The Blue Nose is Canada's flagship boat. She looks very similar to this, and she was hailed as one of the fastest boats ever built. And Essex said, wait a minute, we're gonna build a faster one. So we actually beat the Blue Nose with this boat. What? Yeah. The fastest boat in the world. It's one, it was at its time. It is no longer. This is called the Elsie. She's another super fast boat. And this is the Thomas Lannan, yes. Yeah. Like, why was her name Gertrude? Gertrude? So we name boats after the builder or the person buying the boat, names them after people that they love or people in their families or someone they look up to. Yes. Um, I, in Gloucester, when I used to live in Gloucester, yeah. I used to walk the boulevard. Yeah. And I, I saw this book. Mm -hmm. So that's who this is. Have you seen her before? I might have once. Mm -hmm. So this is the Thomas E. Lannan. Yeah. Um, is the second boat faster than the first boat? Sometimes. It depends on a lot of different factors it's with boats. It's how. Hold on, he's asking a question. It depends on how much weight is in the boat, yes, how much wind there is, and all sorts of things. They were definitely super fast in the races they were in, though. You're right. So this is the Thomas E. Lannan. This is the first boat Harold built, first big schooner, and was launched in Essex. This is the Lewis H. Story, which he built for the Essex Shipbuilding Museum. So this is our flagship. Pretty cool. This is another Chebacco boat, like we talked about. Oops. This is the Schooner Fame. This is the boat I grew up sailing, which is another boat that Harold built. She sails out of Salem now. And this is the Ardell. This is Harold's own boat. So the Ardell is a great example. She was named after, I believe, Harold's great grandmother. That's beautiful. She is oh, beautiful, I've isn't she? Before. Yeah. That was the one that was tripping in the water. Yeah, exactly. So that was her launch. <laughs> And this is her, right, so now she's all rigged up and ready. Flag. No, it didn't have anything on her. If the flags were on it, there would be too much weight with the flag, so it would just fall over. Yeah, exactly, true. so we have to launch them just as the bottom part, which is called the hull. So this is the Schooner Adventure. She was one of those built way earlier, about 100 years ago in Essex, Whoa. but she's still sailing. Nice. This is the Columbia, one of the fastest Whoa. boats. And she's brand new. I'm showing you her for a very specific reason. Essex boats are so loved and so well built and made that when Columbia sank after a very hard race and a very big storm, someone decided that they liked her so much they wanted to rebuild her. So a very wealthy man has remade the Columbia and now sails her out of Florida. But every year she comes back I'm up here to, to sail. Well, maybe you'll get to see her. So, it's now time for the dragon box. You ready? Yeah! All right. Who? Well, it just looks like a dragon. That's why I call it that. So, I want you to raise your hand, and I need you guys to spread back out. Make a nice circle. So you are way too close. Take a big scooch back. Keep scooching. Keep scooching. Keep going. Keep going back, back. All right, so the reason I'm having you move is because this box is full of steam and it's very hot and I'm gonna open it with someone, okay? All right, so first, who had the best breakfast, the best night's sleep, feeling so strong? Hmm, I think you. Yeah, you look really strong. What? 
She feels strong today. Can you bend this without breaking it for me? No. No? I'm a good try. I no, we're just we're just having her try for right now. All right, who didn't have a good breakfast and sleep well? Someone woke him up in the middle of the night. Oh. You? All right, so I need you to come up and you're gonna put these nice gloves on, brand new, wow. just ordered. That's okay. not, that's All right, that's not true. I'm going to put yes, my gloves is. on. The the yep, so you're, you're feeling a little, all right. Do you want a stick like hers or would you like a stick like this? I don't care. You don't care? Let's go for the big one. All right. What about? All right, grab it from the ends and bend it nice and slow. Nice and slow from the end. So ready? I'm going to help you. Hot. It is super hot. Whoa. 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 Do you want to so hold it? Hot. It's sure. cooling off a little bit. Can I? There we go. So what changed? How come she can't bend it, but he can? Know, what he changed? Out. Hold on. Because, um, this it wasn't in my steam box. What else happened? What else have I added to it? This is super hot. I it is. It. Right, I'll take it. Thank you. Hot, I'll take your gloves really too. Weak. If it gets hot, it gets really weak, and you could bend it really well. I like your train of thought, it, but it, uh, weak, but it doesn't. It uh, hold on, exactly. hold on, please. He said it gets super weak. Does this feel weak to you? Feel pretty solid. It feels pretty solid. It's pretty solid. So we didn't weaken it, but I am going to show you something. Thank you very much. Wow. So, I don't quite have enough time today, but maybe when you're in third grade and you come to visit me at the Shipbuilding Museum, you can all do it. All right, so we have one more magic trick that might explain what I'm doing to this wood. So, all right, you ready? What? What allows me to do that? I don't know. I know. Yeah. So what you do is, it, when it gets in the water, it takes all the water and it cools it down, and there might be little cracks Is in any it. of this hot? Touch it. It's okay. It's no. just soapy water. Is it hot? Is no. the water in this cup no. hot? No. 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 So it's not hot. It's cold. Yes. Interesting. So did the water make the little holes? No. Or did the wood have the holes in it already? No. I what? think it absorbed it. It didn't absorb it. Do you have a guess? That the wood already had a tiny, the tiny holes in it? Yeah, so I just want you to see. I didn't make the tiny holes. Wood has all of those holes in it. Can we jump? No. Nope. When the tree is alive, what's going through those tiny holes? Yeah. Sap and water. Exactly. So, so when so the wood is dry, it has some cracks in it, so it can get like the water through it. Because when it was, was well, like where the sap is. But yeah. Then sap so exactly. So those holes are there. So we've got the holes. When I put steam around the wood, that steam is going into those holes. But there's one more thing in wood that allows me to bend and work with it, and that is called a funny word called lignin. And lignin in wood is kind of like plastic or glue that's holding the tree together, but it's flexible enough to allow the tree to move and bend in the wind when it's alive. But once it's dried out, that lignin has gone solid. It's holding on really tight. And so what I'm what do you think the steam does to that lignin? Oh, oh. Yes. It loosens it. That's a good way to put it. It also is putting energy into that lignin so that it can relax and move again. And that's how we can bend the wood. Yes. Oh, never mind. Okay. So there's lots of things I can, nope, we are not going to touch yet. So there's lots of things and shapes I can make out of wood once I've steam bent it. And I've got this one that makes a Whoa. cool shape. But I'm going to go one back up in the pictures for one minute, and I want you to tell me if you can find this piece on that boat. I want one person to go up and point it out. Yes. 
Can you go up and point it out? Can you find it? Exactly. So those are called mast hoops. So can you tell me, is this one piece of wood? Two pieces of wood? Did I carve it out of a tree? It's one piece of wood? You think it's one as well? So my next question is, did I carve it out of a tree like this one, or did I make it out of a strip like this? Um, you carved it out of a tree. Is it, tree? Is it solid? Made, made, made it out of a strip. So I steamed it for a long time in my box, and then I bent it around and around and around a form. Did you actually do that? I did. And so the smaller version of that is to make what's called a jib hank. Yeah, so it goes on and it clips on and it holds the sail onto the boat. Well, can I see? Yep, we can pass that around. I'm going to pass the twisty one around. It does look like a headband. It can be a headband. It does look like a curvy beard. They'll pass it when they're ready. Do you have any questions for me about wood, about anything to do with shipbuilding, the steam box, about sailing, anything? I know about sailing. You know about sailing? That's fantastic. I, in like, um, in the summer, I, like, sail like every day, but Saturday and Sunday. That's fantastic. I'm so glad. It is kind of no, heavy. Jacob, no, I asked Jacob after. And then you, Gabby, and then Josh. Alright. Anybody else have questions? Anything you're curious about? So, don't touch my headband. This is peeling. It is peeling. Why do you think it would do that? Because it maybe it's all wood, and sometimes if all wood sits around, it doesn't do anything. Some parts of it loosen a little bit from the cracks. Exactly. And when the cracks starts getting bigger, right? Bigger and something and it starts to peel. Right. Yeah. Where? Show me. Which one is it you're talking about? Those, those are the seams. So sails like that are made out of strips of cloth because we can't weave one that's big enough for the boat. Does that make sense? All right. Anybody want to see anything else that you didn't get passed around? What do you want to see? I want to see that one. You saw everything, okay. Yeah. The one that looks like a headband is right there. What? Nope. Yeah, what's your question? Yeah, you can look at that one. You can. People make beautiful sculptures. You can make cars, boats, trains. Yeah. You want to see the headband? It's time to make your way to the next presentation. What dolls used to be made out of. Starting around 1850, they came up with a couple of different ways to make dolls. This one is a fabric doll, which was probably homemade by somebody that they could have made at any point in history, because they would take scrap pieces of fabric and make the mother or the grandmother or whoever might make a nice little fabric doll for a girl um, to play with. But then they came out with two different materials. One, this doll is a composite doll, and she's made from sawdust and glue. They would put that in a mold to make her head and the top of her shoulders, you can feel, is hard. And then the rest of her body is fabric. Somebody would have made a fabric body. So she is composite material, sawdust and glue. And then this little baby doll is all made out of a bisque or a china material, and you can feel she's much harder. She'd also be breakable. So you had to be careful with it. And you probably only had one doll or two dolls to play with. So you wanted to be careful with them. And her whole body, you can see, is made out of the china material. So I'm going to pass these around. I'm going to give one to each row. I know you're third graders, right? So I know you're going to be much more organized about this than the second graders. 
because I got five more things to show you. So we got to go through them. So I'm going to start down this end. You can take a look at the dolls, pass them down, and then we'll move on to the next thing. So any questions on the dolls and how, what, the, what they were made out of or how they used to play with them? That doll did not come from China. She was most likely made here in the United States. Um, were dolls usually made in like fancy clothes, like this doll? Like no, that? there would be different, you know, dolls would be made, they most likely would have been in a dress, if it was a girl doll. Um, it, a lot of times, you'd make your own doll clothes at home. You'd take scrap fabrics and Learn to sew that way and make new dresses and whatnot for your dolls. You'd make them at home. Yep. Um, were the China dolls expensive? The China doll would be an example of the most expensive doll from what I've brought. She would have been purchased. She wouldn't have been made at home. Uh, she could have had clothes made for her at home. But she would have most likely uh, come from a small store that was a general type store or a store in the city or a lot of times Sears and Roebuck came out with their catalogs in the early 1900s and that would be kind of your mail order method but there wasn't any big toy store to go and pick uh, whatever you wanted from. Um, is the China doll like Edward from The Miraculous Journey of Edward J. Lane? I don't know because I'm not familiar with that. That book is so good. Is it? It made me cry. Same. All right. I'm not familiar with that one, but it could be. If it's a China doll, it could be like that. Any other doll questions? Yep. Was there a lot of dolls? There wasn't a lot of dolls. I mean, most um, kids might have one or two dolls. You wouldn't have a whole trunk full of dolls and, and uh, toys like you do now. You'd have a couple of special toys. And uh, that would be it. So. so that's my dolls. Did everybody get to see them all? No. Almost? I didn't get to see this one. Okay. Did anybody not get this one yet? Yeah, we did it. All right, pass that to Mila. She loses her hat frequently. Has <laughs> everybody seen that one? Yeah. Okay. So again, I'll say this was a fabric doll. So this was probably made at home uh, for somebody. A lot of times they'd have fabric dolls to take with them if they were going to church or someplace like that where they needed to be quiet because it wouldn't make any clanky noises and whatnot. So that was the fabric doll. Yes? Did that, did that one lose part of its nose? She did. She got chipped. Her nose got kind of broken there. But you can kind of see the material on her nose, what it looks like underneath where the paint so it's is. Like wood. Yeah, well, it's wood and glue. So, yes. You're right. Okay, all right. Shine it all. <laughs> you seen it? All right, got lots to show you. Good? Okay. All right. That's the dolls. So, does anybody know where these might have come from? No, it didn't actually come. It is Legos. I think it's Legos, or it's a type of Lego. What do you think they, they came from? This is now. This is happening now. For the toy store? No. Did anybody have cereal this morning? There's prizes from cereal boxes. So these are two examples that I had friends give me that uh, this one's Frosted Flakes and I think this one was Rice Krispies. Prizes that we get in cereal boxes now. Um, plastic car, little plastic spoon you can get to put together. But I think we used to get much cooler stuff in cereal boxes. But that's because I'm older. So 
These are from the 1950s. They're metal. They're little license plates. They came in Wheaties cereal, and you would collect the different plates, and it would go on your bicycle. So you could put a license plate on your bicycle. So I'm going to pass these around so you can feel they're made out of metal. That, and then one for the back. Back row, back row. OK. So those are the little license plates. And this, I'll ask you questions in one minute, is a kaleidoscope used to come in Captain Crunch. There's, like different there's different colors in it. Yep. So you can turn it. So take a, it's not fair? Yeah. Why? You don't get cool stuff now? Yeah. You get spoons? Yeah. This is pretty good. I'm not sure how much cereal was left in the box when you got the kaleidoscope because it's awfully big. But yeah, we used to get some cool stuff. So I know everybody wants to see the kaleidoscope. The older stuff was cool. So take a quick look and pass it along, because I only have one of the kaleidoscopes. So we want to be able to keep moving. So quick look, pass it along. What do we think that, what is that? This is, a, this is the now version. The car, it's either Hot Wheels or Matchbox. It's metal with a bunch of plastic. The wheels are plastic. It was made in Malaysia. Pretty light, OK? What we used to have, there was two toy companies in the U.S. that made all the die, well not all, I'm sure there was a few others, but the two biggest toy companies in the U.S. made die cast metal toys starting around 1890 up until about 1940s. This is the Tootsie Toy Company, and it's, you'll, you'll see it's definitely a heavier weight than, than that car. Uh, it has rubber wheels on it, hard rubber wheels. Uh, this was made in Pennsylvania, and they did all sorts of different cars and trains and, and other vehicles and whatnot, and that is what the kids would get to play with. This is by the Hubble Toy Company, which actually used to make actual airplanes, and then they started making toy airplanes, and you'll see that the propeller moves, and it has the rubber wheels, and this one, this was, Pen what did I just say? Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and this, so this one was made in New York. So, these are what the toys, the metal toys that the boys and girls had to play with before we came out with these toys. So, so I'm going to start at this end this time, okay? So there's the plane, and be careful with them. And there's the truck. So pass them along. So what are these guys? Army guys. These are cowboys. I didn't have army guys. What are they made out of? Do they? We've probably had the plastic army guys since around 1950s and 60s, but before plastic army guys, they still played with army guys in different figures, but they were made out of metal, mostly. They could have been made out of wood, but usually you saw them, they were made out of metal, they were cast metal, and then they'd be all hand painted. You can see the ones that I'm going to pass around, the paint's been worn off, but they took a lot of time doing the detail work on them, and they were much sturdier and heavier than the little plastic guys that you get now. And then I have one other one, and she's a little milk lady. She's made of the composite material like the doll that I passed around earlier, that's the sawdust and the glue. She was probably from uh, a railroad train model set, where you'd have different people around the town where the trains were set up. So those, before we had the plastic army men, this is what the kids would get to play with. So. I will start passing those around so you can feel the difference. That one, I'll give you that one. And I'll give you, anybody want to look at this one? Yeah. All right. What's this? A phone. A phone. Do you play games on your phone? Yeah. Yeah? So it's kind of a toy that play with now? No, you're not going to play on my phone. But when, when, when kids like you come in my shop, there's two things that I, I always hear them go play with. One is an old manual typewriter, which was too heavy for me to bring in, but everybody always loves to go and feel how it was to press the keys in the typewriter. And the other thing everybody would play with, and I'm going to put these on this table so you can come up and try them in an orderly manner. 
This is an old, uh, in a second. So these were old dial telephones, which we actually used to play with. We'd make crank phone calls on them because nobody knew who was calling them because there was no caller ID. So can I have one volunteer come up and show me how to make a phone call on them? I think you were first. You come on up. How would you make a phone call? Not sure? Does anybody know? Go ahead. Nope, you're wrong. Boy in the black sweatshirt. Nope, you're wrong. Boy in the orange shirt. Bingo. You got to pick up the receiver first. And then, now what do you do? Then what do you do? You don't know now? Wait, is that like not? So you don't have anybody on the phone now. Then what do you have to do? Hey, where does it say ABC? Um, I don't know who's on the phone. You don't know? All right, put it down. Oh, Next girl Wait. in the pink. She yep. No. Nope. You can sit down. All right, show me how to make a phone call. Call your mom. Yep. You got it. All right. So there's two phones to try. If you didn't just get up to come try it, those, those kids should come up first. Give it a try. In a, make like two lines. Orderly. You've been on the train? OK, well, I want to show you something here that once upon a time, the railroad ran to Essex. And if you look at that picture, that's downtown Essex. That's the train station. Now, do you know where the park is behind Town Hall, where there's tennis courts and a ball field? Yeah. OK, this station right here sits where the tennis courts used to. Well, yeah, this is where the tennis courts are today, but it used to be the train station. This is a train that just came to Essex from Boston. Now, long ago, before the railroad came here, the only way in and out of town was a walk out of town, ride a horse, or ride a horse and buggy. And that's a horse and buggy in Essex back around 1870. And in the early history of America, this year, 19, or 2019, is the 150th anniversary of the first transcontinental railroad. Back in the 1800s, every town wanted a railroad. And you can see here, this is a map. This is a railroad from Boston to Ipswich to Newburyport to Portland, Maine. This is a railroad line to Rockport, where I live. And this little black line right here is the line to Essex. Essex wanted a railroad so bad that the town residents voted at town meeting here in Essex to appropriate the money to build a railroad. And they did that in 1871 and 1872. And this is where the railroad began. This is the railroad line to Portland, Maine through, this is Hamilton going to Ipswich, Newburyport. Portland, Maine is up that track. This track curves off and goes to Essex. This big water tank with a windmill on top was for the steam engine. All steam engines burn coal to boil water, to make steam, to make the wheels turn. So this is a water tank in downtown Hamilton. That windmill was a pump to pump water up out of the ground into that tank to go into the engine. This is the parking lot for Crosby's Market today. That's all gone. But this still exists. This is the commuter rail line to Newburyport. Now this is shows the men building the railroad to Essex. You can see they put down the ties or sleepers. They're laying, putting the rail down here and they're advancing towards Essex. Now this is Town Hall, you all know where that is. I'm standing down on the playground yeah. to show you where the railroad was in relation to that. There's the same Town Hall, but here's the railroad running past the Town Hall. This is the first station in Essex. The railroad originally just came to downtown Essex. This station used to sit right down behind the police station. And here's a train. This is 1872 when they first built the railroad here. And why do you suppose they built the railroad to Essex? The number one reason, today everyone has a refrigerator in their house. 
Back in the 1800s, refrigerators had not been invented, so you kept your food cold in an ice box in your house. A big wooden case looked like a dresser drawer with metal boxes inside filled with ice to keep the food cold. This building right here sat down on Shebeko Lake, and this building is the size of a football field covered with wood. To show how big this building is, look at the little freight car right here. This building right here in the wintertime held 200, excuse me, 20,000 tons of ice inside that building. And that ice would be shipped, it was cut on Shebeko Lake, stored in this building in cut blocks, shipped out on railroad cars all over the country. In fact, ice from this ice house went by train to Boston, went by ship to England, and the Queen of, the Queen of England back in the 19th century had uh, cold beverages with ice from Shebeko Lake. Here's an ice cutting machine, a gasoline powered ice cutting machine. You see the wheels that turn the cutting saws. And here's an ice house. There were five big ice houses down on the north shore of Shebeko Lake. And here's a <clears throat> ramp here. This is way in the background. It's a couple hundred feet away. This ramp had a pulley on it, would hoist the blocks up and put them inside. And these buildings had walls that were three feet thick, filled with sawdust and straw, which acted like an insula insulator. This ice would last all summer long in these buildings. Now the other reason, the second most important reason that the railroad was built to Essex, this is downtown Essex, there's the Congregational Church, the police and fire station sit right about here today, the village restaurant is over right in here today. Here's an engine that just brought a freight train into town. You see this first car is loaded with lumber. That lumber went for building ships. The railroad was here in Essex for 70 years, and in the 70 years they built 1,000 wooden sailing ships. This right here is a sailing ship that was built in Essex. This is the schooner Lannan, built at the Burnham shipyard right here in Essex but a thousand of these built in the time of the railroad and the railroad brought all the lumber for making these ships. Now the third reason for coming to Essex was hauling milk and I have a couple of milk cans here. Every day the train, the morning train from Essex would carry anywhere from 40 to 100 gallons of milk from the dairy farms here in Essex and that milk was taken to either a creamery in West Lynn or cream is in Boston, it was made into pasteurized milk to be sold to people at home. Now the railroad obviously also carried passengers. This is a train, remember the old station here is where today's tennis court is, but here's a morning train taking commuters into Boston, waiting to leave Essex. To ride the train, you need a ticket. These top two tickets, these are very enlarged. The real tickets are right over here <clears throat> where your teacher is pointing. These, this first ticket was a ticket to go from Salem, Mass. to Konomo, the very end of the line. This ticket was to go from Hamilton to Essex Falls and they would be collected on the train. Now, long before there was FedEx and UPS, which delivers packages to your house, they didn't exist. The Railway Express Agency was how you got packages. And there's a Railway Express Agency sign, a real metal sign from Rockport over here on the table. But if your mother ordered a washing machine, which was a pretty big deal, the washing machine would come to Essex in a baggage car, be offloaded onto a cart, moved over onto a truck, a Railway Express Agency truck, and delivered to your house. The same thing if you ordered a box, say, of marbles. It would come by Railway Express and be delivered to your house. That's all gone today. The railroad is gone today. Now, how many of you have been swimming at Centennial Grove Park? Great. Did the railroad built Centennial Grove Park in 1876. It was, it was a way for people who lived in the hot, dirty city to come out and go for a swim in the lake in the summertime, but it was the railroad that made your town park more than 100 years ago. And did you know that a president of the United States once visited Centennial Grove Park? President Calvin Coolidge in 1925 came to Centennial Grove to visit the park. There used to be big hotels on that. Yes, in fact, this next picture, this is a train, one train 
14 car long train. Down at the end of the train is the path over to Centennial Grove Park. This one train brought 1,000 people out of Boston to come to your park here in Essex. Does anyone here live on Harry Homan's Drive? Harry Homan's Drive is a town, is a road, a public road on the west side of town. This train is sitting on what is today Harry Homan's Drive. It, it, after the railroad was abandoned, it became a town street. And in fact, this picture, this asphalt road is Harry Homan's Drive and it was once the railroad. Essex is down this way. Going in that direction is Hamilton. Number 27, Harry Homan's Drive. This concrete post here has E2 on this side and H4 on that side. It's a mile post marking the miles from Hamilton to Essex. E2 means two miles behind me is Essex Station. H4 means that four miles down the railroad is Hamilton Station. It's the, one of the few reminders that the railroad once ran here. Now, the railroad brought two huge important things to Essex. The first was worldwide communication. If you had a friend who lived in England back in 1872 and you wanted to communicate with them, you wrote a letter. The letter went on a stagecoach to Hamilton, went on a train to Boston, was put on a wooden sailing ship to sail to England. It would take at least two weeks to cross the ocean on a sailing ship. Get to the house in England, someone would write a letter and send it back the same way. It would take usually five weeks for you to communicate with a friend in England. Right here over the station door is this sign right here, Western Union Telegraph Office. When the telegraph came here, the next picture, and you'll see this actual telegraph key. There's a telegraph key. A man or a woman could to tap that little key and it would send electric impulses across the ocean from the time you sent a message from downtown and all railroad stations were telegraph offices. You could go as a private citizen and send a telegram to a friend in England and it would take four minutes round trip instead of five weeks. That was a huge big deal. There were no telephones. The telephone hadn't been invented. Certainly no radio. That hadn't been invented. But this way through an under the ocean cable you could communicate instantly with countries across the ocean. Now, it was, Morse code? Uh, it was Morse code, absolutely. And I have two telegrams over here to look at later on. Now, the other huge big deal was time. Before the railroad came, every single town in America had its own time based on when the sun was directly overhead at 12 noon. So when it was 12 noon in Essex, it was 11.59 in Ipswich. It was 11.55 in Georgetown. It was 11.50 in Worcester. Imagine trying to run trains across the country when every town had its own time. In November of 1883, the railroads in the United States and Canada got together and created the time zones we're familiar with. Right here on this map is Massachusetts, where we are. All of the green is Eastern time. All of the yellow is central time. All the orange is mountain time. And all of the red is Pacific time. Now right now it's 11, it's 11 a.m. in Massachusetts. It's 10 a.m. in Chicago. It's 9 a.m. in Denver, Colorado. And it is 8 a.m. in San Francisco. So kids in San Francisco are just going to school while you'll be leaving school shortly. And it was the railroads that created time zones in 1883. It took the U.S. government 35 years to adopt what the railroad. It wasn't until 1918, the end of World War I, that Congress adopted the time zones. Now, in 1887, the railroad extended itself another half a mile over to the Konomo part of town. This is Konomo Station, the end of the line. This is what it looked like in 1900. This is what it looks like today. It is a private home. It is the only railroad station left on the line. And the reason it still exists is converted into a private home. 1900 and today, 2019. Now the reason the railroad was extended another half a mile is this building here. This huge building with a smokestack, this three-story building, was a shoe factory, the S.B. Fuller Shoe Factory, 
100 people worked in this factory making shoes here in Essex. Who would believe that? A huge factory making shoes. Anybody have shoes from SB Shoe Factory? <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. It's long gone. Now, all of the leather to make shoes came by train, and all of the shoes that were made in this factory were shipped out by train. And this, all of you look at this picture. This is what school looked like in 1900 over in Konomo. Actually, Konomo was called Thompson Village back in 1900. And this is the Thompson Island School, which was near the shoe factory. And these are all the children in school and their teacher, but 119 years ago. I've often wondered, why is this little boy sitting out front? Either he was the best student in class, or he was the worst in class, and the teacher could watch him. But anyhow, this is what a school looked like 119 years ago, right here in Essex. Now, in 1895, I have three trains up here, a freight train, a passenger train, and the electric trolleys. In 1895, they dug up the streets of Essex and they laid railroad tracks, covered them back over, put up wires and ran trolley cars. Now look at that picture and notice this building with a chimney. This is made of brick and this wooden house in this picture. Look very carefully right there. That's what it looks like today. Here's the brick house with the chimney, the wooden house. The mobile gas station is right down here and we're looking back towards downtown. So here's what it looked like 1895, and here it is today. <laughs> so the, the trolley was a big deal because the trolley was a non-polluting vehicle. There was no gas engine or diesel engine on it. It took electricity from overhead wires. The power plant where they generated electricity for the trolley cars was right here in Essex. This, is, this still exists, this building is this building right here. It's Carpenter and McNeil. They design and build houses, but the building they use, this is where the trolley cars were kept. This is where the uh, power plant was to generate electricity. Same building. And this is what a trolley car looked like. And this trolley car is waiting on the west end of town. This line here goes to Ipswich that way. We're waiting for a trolley coming this way from Beverly which will continue on this way to Gloucester and Rockport. This trolley car was meeting one coming from Beverly, and the people going to Ipswich or Newburyport would get on this trolley and continue on to Ipswich. Now this picture, I live in the north end of Rockport in a place called Pigeon Cove. I found this picture in my attic in Pigeon Cove. These are chill. This picture was taken in 1905. These children, there's one, two, three trolley cars. These children just came from Rockport on the trolley car to go to Centennial Grove to go to the beach. And this is the man who chartered the trolley cars, Reverend Pingree, who used to live across the street from where I live today. But notice what these children are wearing. Even the boys are wearing knee-high wool socks and knickers. And the girls, look what they're wearing. They're wearing wool socks. And this is July. Think of a hot summer day. And look how much clothes they're wearing, but they're going down to the beach. They had to wear bathing suits that completely covered their bodies back then. Now this is why the trolley cars ended. They only lasted for 25 years. This is the main road across the causeway. Here's the church, the village restaurants right over here. This is the cause, causeway. They're building the new restaurant and brewery right in here. But all these cars are what caused the end of the trolley. People would rather have their own automobile than pay money to ride the trolley car even though the trolley was a non-polluting transportation vehicle. It did not emit any fumes. These cars are all here to watch the launch of the schooner Mayflower, not to be confused with what the pilgrims came over. The Mayflower was a wooden sailing ship uh, built here in Essex. Now, does everyone know where this is? That's the, that's the municipal parking lot. The police and fire station are over here. The village restaurant's up here in the trees. The post office is right over here. That's what it looked like last October. This is what the same view, and this is 1935, six years before the start of World War I. 
This building here is where they worked on these old steam engines at night. And this train is sitting here. The depot is right over here. But this train is sitting here because on Sundays they never ran trains out of Essex. This is laying over on Sunday, getting its rest on Sunday. This building where they repaired steam engines was the Essex Town DPW Garage, the Department of Public Works Garage, until 2002 when they created the town municipal parking lot. But this is what it looks like today. This is what it looked like 80 years ago. Now, the railroad lasted for 70 years until one year into World War II. December 19th of 19th, Saturday, December 19th, 1942, the very last train left Rockport. This is obviously not summer because it was winter, but this is taken on the station platform watching a train leave Essex going to Hamilton. Saturday, December 19th, the last train ran. Monday morning, December 21st, they started tearing up the railroad. This crane is lifting up rails off the old railroad, and by Friday, by Christmas Day, one week after the last train ran, the railroad was completely gone. All these rails lifted up and put on railroad cars. And this is a railroad crane sitting on tracks, but lifting the rails behind it. All those steel rails got melted down into new steel in a um, foundry someplace and probably made into a battleship or cannons for the war. But it was the end of the railroad. And this is the end of my discussion. And does anyone here have any questions? Do you have a question, young lady? Do you have a question? You've been on a steam train? There are a few places where you can ride. If you go to Portland, Maine, down on the waterfront, they run steam trains in the summer. There are steam trains. There are a few steam trains all over the country, but they're at museums, tourist railroads. They're not, real railroads don't use them anymore. They all use diesel locomotives. And I drove diesel locomotives. They take a lot less, so you can ride up to Mount Washington on the Cog Railroad. It still runs today. And if you ride the first train in the morning to the top of the highest mountain in New England, it's a steam powered train. It burns a ton of coal and uses 600 gallons of water to go one way to the top of the mountain and back. The new diesel trains that go up the mountain, remember, ton of coal, 2,000 pounds of coal, 600 gallons of water. The diesel trains that go up the mountain today burn 17 gallons of diesel fuel. It costs a whole lot less money. And what, that's why they use diesel locomotives. They're much more efficient, they use much less fuel, and they're cheaper to run. Yes, ma'am. That's how I met my wife. I used to drive the train, and my wife was a passenger on the train before we got married. So that's pretty cool. That's how most people know the train. They take the train to Boston. I could drive my train from Rockport in the morning. I would have 1,000 passengers on my train. I measured the fuel at Rockport, and I measured the fuel at Boston, and to take 1,000 people into Boston, I burn 100 gallons of diesel fuel. If those thousand people individually drove their cars instead of taking the train collectively. A thousand people driving their own cars would burn 1,570 gallons of gasoline to do what I did with 100 gallons of diesel fuel. If the railroad had lasted until after World War II, it might still come to Essex, but it was economy. By the end of the era, there was only one train in in the morning, one train out of night. And the railroad said, we can't justify maintaining five miles of track for one train a day. So if you'd like to come up here and walk around and look at the table, there's all kinds of things to look at here. Those are the trolley cars that used to run. Don't, don't touch the trains, but the other things you can touch. Now, these are milk cans, just a couple of kinds of milk cans. That one carried cream, the other held milk. How can you make a train? Does anyone have milk donors today? Pardon? If anybody gets milk delivered to their house anymore. Yeah, does anyone? You have milk delivered to your house? No. No. When, when I was a little boy, the milkman came to the house. Now, do you know why there's sand in that car? The railroad, believe it or not, carried sand. Be, be, be very careful. The train would bring coal to Essex 
to burn in people's houses to heat their house and carry sand back to the General Electric plant in uh, Lynn because they would cast steel parts uh, to make turbines there. Yeah, yeah.